It's a phenomenon unknown to many, yet it threatens almost half of the world's land. It's called desertification, and if left unchecked, its effects are disastrous. But in the dry lands of Brazil, new hope is emerging and capturing the world's attention. Standing tall in Canindere, in the heart of the Brazilian drylands, is one of the world's largest religious monuments, St. Francis, the saint of the poor. At his feet, ribbons bear witness to millions of destitute pilgrims who have prayed to this revered saint, seeking the miracle of water. The first drought I saw was in 1958. I was 12 years old. Napoleon Furtado, owner of a small farm in the region, has seen firsthand drought's disastrous consequences. The water slowly vanishes. The pastures also vanish. And people see their cattle starve. The drought punishes everything, people, cattle, animals. <laughs> Drought is not unusual in dry lands around the world. In this arid ecosystem, water is a scarce and precious resource. But since 40% of the earth is dry lands, in which nearly half of the world's food is produced, the farming solutions developed here could help save the planet's food supply. In northeastern Brazil, a drought can continue for up to five years. But subsistence farming used to be possible even in these harsh conditions. 30 years ago, this whole area was productive. There was more vegetation. There wasn't the erosion we see today. But in the last three decades, things slowly changed, says farmer Francisco Neto. Slash-and-burn agriculture and unrestrained deforestation impoverish the soil, almost to a point of no return. There is an area where we used to produce 420 bags of beans. In recent years, we hit a low of only 30 bags. This region, the size of France and Germany combined, and home to 25 million people, is at risk of becoming a desert. This phenomenon, when fertile farmland slowly changes into barren wasteland, is called desertification, and it's affecting dry lands worldwide. Desperate farmers have even turned to violence, says villager Maria Eleni. Farmers invaded towns, they rioted, they did it because they were starving. Hundreds of thousands of others were forced to leave in search of jobs. This region was almost entirely deserted. I would look around me and I would think, I also had to leave, that my children had to leave. While Francisco managed to stay, Napoleon on the other hand, was forced to leave for a time. I was in debt and I needed money. I went to Fortaleza for two years looking for work and left my family behind. Fortaleza is where the Brazilian drylands meet the Atlantic Ocean, a city of beautiful tropical beaches and stark social contrast. Waves of migrants from the drylands, like Napoleon, have swelled the city slums. In an attempt to ease this situation, the Brazilian government built massive reservoirs like this one, the largest in Latin America. But desertification in the drylands created serious problems. Soil drifted into the reservoirs during the rainy season, the muddy water sickening many villagers. We'd have stomach pains and dysentery because we drink dirty water. 
Eventually, there was so much soil in reservoirs like these, they slowly began to disappear. There were reservoirs that were four meters deep, and then they would shrink to one to two meters deep. An initiative partially funded by the World Bank was launched to help keep the reservoirs clean and soon expanded to also help combat desertification. The project's basic concept is simple. Educate farmers on a number of low-cost, time-proven methods of land cultivation, like this ancient technique designed to hold on to water. This group is building terraces for cultivation. Monica Freitas, project coordinator, says the graded slopes prevent rainwater from drifting. This construction retains water in the soil and encourages the emergence of water holes. Other techniques include creating underground water pockets by inserting plastic barriers into trenches and replanting trees on essential riverbeds to keep the soil in place. What's more, numerous cisterns like these were built to harvest rainwater for drinking. Each provides a family of five with drinking water for up to eight months. The effort seemed to be working and has caught worldwide attention. Streams and watering holes have begun to spring up. Native fauna has returned and farmers can harvest for many extra months. The communities have slowly taken over the project's coordination and planning. Leading the charge in the region is Napoleon, who proudly travels to other communities to share these techniques. Techniques that in some cases have shown so much promise that many former migrants have been able to return home. If it's only one person, it's hard. But when more people get involved, things really work. What's happening here, many believe, is a lesson for the world, so that, unlike their forefathers, future generations don't depend only on hope and prayer. <laughs>